Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Thank you. Good to see all of you this morning. Good to have you here. If you want to follow along this morning, the message, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, beginning at verse 7, as we continue our series in the book of Hebrews. And also, just a reminder, our Wednesday night has been going great. You all have responded to the challenge. We've had a great first five weeks. We've got three weeks to go. So let's finish strong on Wednesday night. Three, three more weeks for God to build our faith in him from the book of Habakkuk. So this morning, if I had to title the message, uh, it would be, Don't Stop Believing. Don't Stop Believing believing. I'm going to divide this message into three parts this morning. First part is in chapter 3, verse 7, where the author says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. And then he begins, the author, whoever the author is, we are not sure who the human author is of the book of Hebrews, but he begins to quote, Psalm 95, and he quotes a rather large section of Psalm 95. In your Bibles, you probably see that either in a different kind of type or offset or whatever to let you know that this is quoted now from another part of Scripture. The thing that I want to remind all of us this morning is this. You will notice that as the author is quoting Psalm 95, he is reminding us this is not man speaking to men. This is God speaking. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes scripture. We need to be reminded that the reason why the Bible should hold the authority and the weight that it does in our lives is because this is not the words of men, this is the Word of God. This is God himself speaking to us. And then he says, today, if you will hear his voice, listen as he speaks. So you will notice something else here. Not only is God speaking, but the author is saying even in his day that thousand years from when God first spoke this, that it's still as relevant today in his day as it was when God first spoke it. It still should resonate with the people of God as strongly today as it did then. And God is saying the same thing today. He's saying, listen, my word has or should have no less force today than it had when it was first written down. That's, again, the amazing thing about the Word of God, is you and I know it is the Word of God because no matter how many years pass, no matter how many decades pass, how many centuries pass, how many millennia pass, it is still very relevant to us right here and now. It has very much practical application for our Christian life. So the author is saying, Let's be reminded in this message of never stop believing in God that God is speaking to us and he's speaking to us this very day. In fact, this very moment, God wants to speak to us. And we shouldn't take that for granted because at the end of the Old Testament era, God voice went silent for 400 years before the start of the New Testament. He stopped speaking because people stopped listening. And God is not a God that's going to waste his energy, his breath, or his words speaking out if no one is going to listen. God will just say, I'm done. So, the author is saying we should very much count it a privilege 
and a great opportunity that God is still willing to speak to us if we are willing to listen. And that's the first part. The second part of the message is that you will notice here in this passage of Scripture that the author is quoting from Psalm 95. He is saying this to his readers and to us today. That we have a very important lesson to learn from the example of the nation of Israel after the Exodus. That there is something in that experience that they went through that we can apply to our own lives. So notice what he says, verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 3. Oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the days of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers tested me and tried me. What's that mean? It simply means that they kept asking God, prove yourself to us, God. Prove yourself over and over again. No matter what God did, they still wanted more proof, more signs before they would believe, before they would step out onto the ocean, if you will, that we just sang about. He says, therefore, I became provoked at that generation and said, their hearts are always wandering and they have not known my ways. So as I swear in my anger, they will never enter my rest. Now go over for just a moment, and we'll come back to those, to verse 16, where again the author says, For which ones heard and rebelled? Was it not all who came out of Egypt under Moses' leadership? And against whom was God provoked for 40 years? By the way, the word provoked means grieved. Was it not those who sinned, whose dead bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would never enter into his rest except those who were disobedient? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. What is the important lesson for us today in his day that those who follow Christ need to hear in order that we don't make the same mistake that the nation of Israel did. Well, let me simplify it a little bit and summarize it in this way. We know, as he says here, that these people all were willing to believe God to a point because all of them followed Moses and his leadership and were willing to follow him out of Egypt. They were willing to say, God, thank you for setting us free from our enslavement to the Egyptians, and we will believe you enough to leave Egypt. But then God came along after they had, you know, left Egypt and said, oh, this isn't all that I have for you. I never intended for it just to be I get you out of Egypt. He said, I was always about not only bringing you out, but bringing you in. I want to bring you into this thing that I prepared called the promised land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and it will be a sort of symbolic of you finally being settled in me. Finally, that you will be satisfied and fulfilled in what I have for you. And you will experience wonderful things in this place. And if you know the story at all uh, at this point, you know that Moses sent out the spies into the land and they came back with the report that, you know what, the land is just like God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, but even though God said, I'll be with you, I'll fight your battles, I'll drive out all the inhabitants of the land and I will give you this land, they didn't believe. They come back and say, oh, you, there's giants in that land. And they're stronger than we are. And there's no way possible that we can go up and inhabit that land. And, and what the author is saying is you, you realize what's going on here, right? That just like us, if you're a Christian here today, you've been set free from your Egypt. Egypt. 
and my Egypt. But that wasn't all that God had planned for us. Any more than that was all that God had planned for the children of Israel. He had this wonderful life ahead for them to experience with him. And our church, every church, I believe, that's established on the foundation of Jesus Christ has a promised land, if you will, waiting for us corporately. And every one of us as Christians has an individual promised land awaiting us in this life. Because the promised land is not equivalent to heaven, as some people have taught over the years. That is a very wrong interpretation of the promised land. I'll give you just one reason why. There were battles to fight and enemies to conquer in the promised land, right? When you and I get to heaven, to glory, there will be no more battles to fight or enemies to fight, okay? So the promised land is not equivalent to heaven. The promised land is equivalent to the victorious Christian life, to experiencing the spiritual life and journey with God that God intended for you and I individually to have with him and corporately for us to have with him. And what the author is saying to us is this. Here's the lesson. They never experienced God's best in this life. They missed out on the promised land because they stopped believing in God. They never got all that God intended out of this life. They stopped short. They believed in him up to a point, but then they said, that's it, we're not going any further. And God said, fine, you'll wander for 40 years and you'll die here before you ever get there because the only way to get there is by faith. In fact, he makes that very clear in verse 19 of chapter 3. He says, they could not enter because of their unbelief, their lack of faith or faithfulness or faithlessness, if you will. And the author, again, the reason he's quoting this is he's saying, even though we're not Israel, the same thing can happen to us in our Christian life. God has all this plan for us, again, based upon the potential that he placed in us that we've been talking about, and yet so many Christians, just as the nation of Israel, miss out on their individual promised land, or corporately, churches or community of believers miss out on their corporate promised land because we come to believe in God up to a point, but then we say, God, I'm not following you any longer than that. No, I'm not going down that road. No, I'm not going to do that. So belief but it has its limit. In fact, if you go back to chapter 3, verse 10, notice what God says about them and can be also true of us. He says, their hearts are always wandering. And isn't that interesting? Because that's exactly physically what they did for 40 years. To picture for us that what was happening externally in the nation of Israel was actually hap happening already internally. They were wandering. They were never settled. They were restless. Just like many Christians today. Never really at rest in God never really settled in God, never really satisfied or fulfilled in what God has for them. They're all, it's, I gotta do this my way, God, and I, I gotta find my satisfaction and fulfillment with you, but also beyond you or apart from you. And you know the story of the nation of Israel. They not only got to the point where they said, we're not going in. Remember what they said? They said, we want to go back to Egypt. Because it was better for us than what we're experiencing with you, God, now. Wow. And that's, a, that's an important point, too, because as I've said, you and I either are moving forward with God or we're moving backward with God. We're either progressing or regressing. There is no such thing in the Bible as a Christian or a follower of God getting to a point 
plateauing there, staying stationary, and just staying at that point. We're either moving forward or moving backward. And you see that with the nation of Israel. And what God says is they're always wandering. They're always restless. They're so unsettled. And physically, that's exactly what happened. They literally went around in circles for 40 years until that generation died off. Sad to say, that's the way many followers of Jesus Christ are living their life today because they are not heeding the warning of Scripture that the same thing can happen to us, the same missed opportunities can happen to us that happened to the nation of Israel. Here's an individual promised land God has for us. Here's a corporate promised land that God has for us, and we can miss out on it if we don't keep believing and following. And then he says, I love this, God says, they never knew my ways. Now, wait a minute, God. Aren't these the same people that saw all the 10 plagues that you poured out on Pharaoh and the Egyptians? Yeah. Isn't this the same people that were led by the pillar of cloud in the daytime and the pillar of fire by night? Yeah. Isn't this the same people that walked through the Red Sea on dry ground? Yeah. They experienced all of that. They saw all the wonderful miracles and the power of God, and yet God said, they never knew me. You know why? Because the word knew here, or to know, speaks about a firsthand, experiential, intimate knowing. In other words, he said, they knew about me, just like many Christians today can be in a local church where they see God move and they hear God speak and whatever, but it never really affects them personally. They don't understand the whole concept of a personal relationship with God. To them, it's still about religion. It's still about rules, regulations, rituals. They never get to really this idea of walking with God and knowing God in that way. They know about him, but they don't know him on a first hand. Everything that they know about God is second hand. They know what they know from somebody else, but they don't know it themselves. That might be some of you today. You, you, the only way you know God is by being maybe in the house of God where you sense God but there's no firsthand, experiential, intimate relationship with God. And God is saying, you and I can experience great miracles. We can see his power displayed. We can do all of that and yet not know him. And God is saying, do you understand that as I'm speaking to you, the same thing can be true today. Just as true today as it was thousands of years ago to the nation of Israel. They missed out on their promised land. Yes, they were willing to believe enough to escape their slavery in Egypt, but it never went beyond that. They were never willing to continue to follow God and keep believing in him. They basically sat down and stopped believing. And God said, fine, that's your choice. But you think about what they missed by wandering around in circles for 40 years. And that's literally, if you take a map and you see where they went, they literally just kept going around a circle in the Middle East. I think of how sad that is that so many people who claim to follow Christ, that's, that's their life. It never really gets on a steady forward progression. It's just constantly just circling around. Because notice what God says also in verse 11. He says, they will never enter my rest. And then he talks over in verse 18 about his rest. Rest. 
Why? Because there's a rest that only God can give us. Just like Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Therefore, in me, you can have peace. Even though everything around you may be unbelievably chaotic and turbulent and troubled, in me, you can have peace. God is saying the same thing about his rest. He's saying, in me, if you let me provide this for you, if you find your, your satisfaction and fulfillment in me and what I have for you, if you're willing to settle down in me and be at rest in me, then you'll find a rest that you can't get any, anywhere else. There will be such a stability and settledness to your life that you will stop wandering and stop circling and stop roaming and you will finally be personally, spiritually, soulfully at rest. They never were. Just like many followers of Christ today, they live their whole life on earth after they're saved, but they're never really at rest. They, they never have experienced a rest that only comes from him. So let's get to the third part. How do we escape that fate? How can we get to our promised land? How can we keep believing and not be like the nation of Israel and just sit down faithless toward God? Well, look at the word of God beginning in verse 12. The first thing he says, and by the way, you'll notice here, he's not talking to people that don't know God. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters. He's talking to fellow believers. He's talking to Christians. He's saying the same thing can happen to Christians that happened to the nation of Israel. And the first thing we see here is those first three words of verse 12, see to it. It's one Greek word. It's only used a few times in the New Testament, but it's a very important word. It means to stay focused. It means to always be aware and alert. Well, what to? Well, in the context, he's saying, here's one of the ways that you and I can prevent ourselves from, from going down the same road as the nation of Israel, and that's being aware continually in my life that the same thing could happen to me that happened to them that I could miss out on my promised land, that we could miss out on our promised land, that we might not ever experience all that God has for us in this life if we stop believing. So he says, see to it, brothers and sisters. Don't take your eye off the goal, if you will. Don't take your eye off the ball, spiritually speaking. As Paul said, I'm forgetting the things that are behind and I'm pressing towards the things that are ahead and I'm going to keep myself focused on this one thing. I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That was how Paul was able to see to it. Because Paul got up every day with that goal in mind. The goal was, God, I don't want to miss out on what you have for me in this life, so I've got to be aware that I don't make the same mistake, so I've got to stay focused spiritually. I cannot lose my focus. I can't take days and weeks and months off spiritually and not pay the consequences for it, not pay a very high price for it. I've got to see to it every day. And we'll get to that in just a moment. That's the first thing he said. Then you'll notice he says, stay close to God. Not only stay focused, but stay close to God. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart that forsakes the living God. The word forsake means to pull away from. God, I, you're, you're my shepherd. You're leading me down this path right now, just like the nation of Israel. I don't want to go. So I'm pulling away. And, and notice he says, 
Here's what happens even before you start to pull away. He said, you and I can develop, just like the nation of Israel, an evil, unbelieving heart. What does that mean? It simply means that our heart can get to a place where we lack the resolve and willingness to continue to follow God. And he says, you realize you and I can't stay close to God if he's leading us down here and our heart, if you will, our attitude, our mind, is unwilling to follow. The way you and I stay close to God at all times is to follow him, which is exactly what Jesus said to his first disciples, did he not? He, he, he said, follow me. Learn to follow me. See, again, the nation of Israel was willing to follow God out of Egypt, but then once they got out of Egypt into that region called Kadesh Barnea, they weren't willing to follow God to the promised land. As a church, we can get like that too. We can say, God, I'm gonna, we're going to follow you up to this point in our history, but then we're not going any further because we don't like where you're taking us or we don't even know where you're taking us, but we're done. We're sitting down. And we can do that individually. So he says, first of all, we got to stay focused we got to understand that the possibility of missing out on what God has for us is something that can be true in our lives. So we better take this seriously. We better stay focused. And then he says, and you got to stay close to God. And how do we stay close to God? By following him every day. And not pulling away and saying, God, I want to go my own way. And we know that's true. That's why the Bible uses the metaphor of sheep for those who follow, because like sheep, we all want to go our own way and go astray. And God says, you will never experience all that I have for you and the promised land that I have for you in this life if you're not willing to continue to follow me. Maybe you followed me up to this point, but you got to keep following me. you got to keep believing in me all the way. And then the next thing he says in verse 13, we got to stay close to one another. Oh, this is so needed today in our Christian churches. But exhort one another each day as long as it is called today so that none of you may become hardened by sin's deception. Do you know what the word exhort means? It means right beside each other, strengthen and encourage one another. So a couple things. First of all, how can we exhort or encourage or strengthen one another if we're not beside each other? If we're not together, ever? If the only time I see you is once a month, how's that going to take place? And you'll notice he says exhort one another how often? Every day. We'll get to that in just a moment. He's saying, guys, you not only have to stay close to God as fellow believers, you got to stay close to one another. Why? Because God wants to make these fellowships of Christians places of mutual strengthening and encouragement. And how can you be encouraged and how can I be encouraged if we're never together? That's why some people say, oh, Jeff, you're a little bit too, uh, you know, passionate about making sure people come to church regularly as if that's somehow unbiblical, that I should expect Christians be in church on Sunday faithfully. Like, that's, that's an expectation we shouldn't have of each other? Biblically, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's part of the problem of why many Christians today are restless and unsettled and wandering and going around circles spiritually because they are not taking what God says seriously. We've got to stay close to each other too, as well as God, so that we can mutually encourage and strengthen one another. That was part of the difference with the early church, by the way, when many Christians say, how comes the church today doesn't have the power and, and how comes we don't see God moving and working like he did in the book of Acts? Well, if you go back to the book of Acts in the very first couple chapters of the book of Acts, what were those Christians doing? 
They were getting together how often? Every day. Every day. There was some kind of connection with one another, at least a few of them, every day so that they could open themselves up to the encouragement and strengthening that they could get from their brothers and sisters and so that they could be a strength and encouragement and comfort to their brothers and sisters. And we wonder now why we struggle so much when we go weeks and months without really having any connection or contact or relationship or fellowship with each other. I'm just a little passionate about that point. <laughs> Only because I see as a pastor it's so neglected by so many who profess the name of Christ today. So stay focused, stay close to God, stay close to one another, and then, fourth, make the most of every day. Did you notice how often in this passage he uses the word today, which means this very day, this time right now? You go back to verse 7. Oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Then he talks again in verse 12 about exhorting one another each day. Then you go down to verse 14 and 15. Oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. And then even after, up in chapter 4, verse 7, he quotes that verse again. Oh, today. Why is he using the word today and each day over and over again? Because he's saying, do you realize that one 24-hour period can make a huge difference in whether we keep believing or stop believing? That, that what happens even right now in this hour that you and I have every Sunday can be huge as far as where we go, spiritually speaking. That what we do in a minute can make a difference. It is literally seizing the day and saying, this very day can make a difference in my eternity. This very day can make a difference in my earthly life and even not only into eternity, but experiencing the promised land that God has for me. This day, right now, this present time, this very precious time, which is why the Bible said, teach us to number our days, Psalm 90, verse 12, so that we might apply our hearts to wisdom or live more wisely. I know those of you here in the audience this morning who are as old as me or older understand this. Time is going by very quickly, even more rapidly than you and I even can imagine. It's actually one of the biblical markers of why I believe we're living in the last days. You realize how fast time's going. Weeks, months, and years can fly by, and all of a sudden we look up and go, where did that part of my life even go? And Jesus said, that's why my followers shouldn't get so mindful of what's going to happen tomorrow or what could happen tomorrow, Matthew chapter 6. He says, just set your mind on the things of today, because today has enough to deal with. And you'll never get the most out of today if your mind is always distracted by the tomorrows. Amen. There's something to be done today. Something that could happen today. So make the most of every day. And then the final point. What's another way that we can escape the fate of the Israelites in relation to their promised land? Look at again at verse 15. It's the word listen. Oh, that today, and of course he's repeated this many times too. Oh, that today you and I would listen as he speaks. Let me ask you a question. When you wake up in the morning as a follower of Jesus Christ, are you waking up listening for the voice of God? Are we waking up every day not only listening for the voice of God, are we listening to the voice of God? 
Jesus said, my sheep should hear my voice. I think one of the reasons that that's maybe more of a challenge and difficult for many people today is because we keep so busy and we run so hard through each of our days that at least during the time that we're mostly awake and alert, we've got so many other things filling our lives and minds that even if God was trying to talk to us, we, we couldn't hear through all the noise. And then when we finally are, just, it's just us and God, say at the end of the day, we finally lay our head on that pillow at night. We either fall asleep quickly or because of the shape we're in, we're taking so many sleeping pills to force ourselves to fall asleep because we don't want to stay awake too long for many reasons, but one of them might be if I actually keep silent and it's just me and God and I hear God's voice, I don't want to put myself in that position, so I want to shut off as quickly as possible. And yet there's something very precious about knowing that God still wants to get our attention and still wants to speak into our lives. And I firmly believe with all of my heart that God is speaking to each of us today. Right, right now, today, he is speaking to us. The, qu the question is, are we listening? Are we listening to what God is saying to us right now? And listen. I may be a pastor, but I don't pretend to know what that is in your life. That's between you and God. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. But my encouragement to you as your pastor is this. That if God is speaking to you and you're listening for his voice, that you would do as the author of Hebrews said that we would listen, listen as he speaks. Let's stand. There's a time to sing and praise the Lord, and we're going to do that in just a moment. But there's also a very important time in our worship of God that is this, and that is silence. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Do you know silence before God is actually an act of worship? In fact, if you come back Wednesday night for Bible study, you're going to see this even from the book of Habakkuk. Silence before God is an act of worship. So here's what I'd like to do for just a moment, because I know it's going to make some of you squirm. And I'm not doing it just for that reason. I'm doing it because I think it's what God has led me to do, what I'm hearing him say. And that is before we sing this wonderful song in closing of looking to God and letting him lead us and guide us and direct us and keep following him and believing in him, no matter where that is, that we just pause for a moment and that we, in an act of worship, of again, knowing who he is and He's in heaven and we're on earth, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, that we come into his house and we let our words be few and we just be silent before him for a moment and we listen for his voice. So let's do that for just a moment this morning and then I'll close in prayer. Lord, there's something very special about silence. 
especially when we spend ourselves silent before you at times so that we can truly hear you speaking to us. And God, I believe that you have spoken today. May we listen as you speak. And God, because you are a God who so graciously is speaking to us and wanting to continue to lead and guide and direct our lives, we thank you for that. And so we pray in just a moment as we lift up our voices that we would sing with everything we've got. Because, Lord, your word tells us that everything that has breath should praise the Lord. And if we're able to stand this morning in this auditorium, that means we have breath. That means we should praise you. So, God, may we direct this song and the words of this song towards you today, and may it be words that truly are sincerely and genuinely sung from our heart to you today. As your sheep, God, may we allow you to be our shepherd, leading us, guiding us, directing us, and most of all, speaking to us as we listen for your voice. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.